welcome back to the Workforce Identity Developer Podcast from Okta. Today, I'm joined by Laura Rodriguez and Elisa Duncan. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Today, we're going to be talking about the SDKs that we have at Okta. And Laura is a staff SDK engineer here. So, Laura, what does an SDK engineer at Okta do? Our team basically takes uh, care of SDKs and other developer tools. And we are also very involved in the API design. Uh, so what we do is uh, basically we do, we review uh, the API designs that other teams uh, propose. Um, we provide a lot of feedback because we have like an overall view of all the APIs since they all end up into any of our SDKs. Um, we also, build SDKs and CLIs and other tools. Uh, we interact with people on GitHub, um, take care of like um, request issues, etc. And also um, internally, we have our roadmap. We have uh, also close communication with ca um, customer support. So we basically have um, many different things to work on during like a sprint that more or less what we take care of. And Alisa is a staff developer advocate in workforce identity. Alisa, what do we do in advocacy and how's that tie in with the SDKs? Sure, yes. I use the SDKs that Laura writes and try them <laughs> in different applications, build them out, make sure that the developers using Okta have a really good experience when they use it within their application. So the developer advocacy team are the first line feedback providers to the SDK team on using the SDKs. Some listeners have used SDKs a bunch. Others might have just heard the buzzword. Um, and Elisa, how would a developer use the API if they didn't have an SDK available? Right. So that could be a pretty involved process. You'd have to figure out the APIs that are available and um, all the different parameters that you would have to pass in. If you were trying to do a authentication using OIDC, that could be multiple calls in there. You could do that within your application or through a HTTP tool of such as like Hopscotch or Postman, but there's different ways you could do it, or you could maybe go the easy route, right? And if you've written code that's uh, hitting the API directly, any change to that API is also going to break your code. So Laura, how does the SDK improve this process. Alisa uh, mentioned um, you can go the hard way and write a wrapper yourself or you can use our SDK. So basically our SDKs, of course, uh, they basically they basically are a wrapper to the APIs, but we also provide additional features and we all take care of breaking changes. We use semantic versions, so if you pay attention to the version, to the releases that we do, you can have um, an idea of like is, if an upgrading will break your code or not. And also you don't have to worry about uh, vulnerable uh, dependencies because we take care of that, plus additional features. Um, so an SDK is more than just an API wrapper and yeah. it has some convenience for developers. So Laura, why do we need so many SDKs for so many different platforms and even frameworks? So because um, each language uh, has its own idiomatic features and what we try to do is just to be uh, to provide an SDK for all the tastes. We have different um, uh, developers communities that that we provide SDKs and SDKs are different between them. And also if you are a front-end developer, uh, you might need a dif different features as a back-end developer, right? Because it's a different, total different uh, developer experience. Um, so we try to um, build SDKs idiomatic to the specific language uh, to the specific ecosystem. Uh, for example, we have the .NET SDK, the Java SDK. We also have uh, the Node SDK. So each of those libraries try to be um, idiomatic again to the language, to the ecosystem and follow the 
guidance for that specific um, environment, I would say. Yeah, so it's like the SDK will help you use that language or framework's best practices and right. more seamlessly integrate with all the features that the Okta API gives you. Right. So Laura, how do we build the SDK? All those different ones. Yes. Uh, so we have different ways to build SDKs. Um, so for example, for the management SDK, we use code generators. Um, we do have an open API specification for the management APIs. So that facilitate the um, the release process because we have a code generator that in a few minutes you just have an SDK in specific language or even like CLIs. Uh, but then we have other type of SDKs where we do not have an open API specification or where like um, the feature that we provide uh, requires um, many, many or different calls. Uh, one example of that is the, the ASP.NET SDK, which is basically a, a framework uh, integration with ASP.NET. And the idea is that you can use that in any of your ASP.NET applications and you just plug in uh, Okta seamlessly. Um, for that case, uh, since it's a framework integration, uh, we don't use code generators, so we do that work uh, manually. Um, so yeah, we have different ways. Uh, code generators, it's the easiest one, um, but we also do, depending on the tools uh, or the SDKs, we might uh, decide one uh, approach or the other. Do we put all of the API features into every SDK or do you need to curate them based on some constraints? Yes. So first we have um, categories uh, for, for our APIs because um, we, we think of um, APIs as a set to um, fulfill certain uh, personas, I would say. So first, like we have kind of a um, category for them uh, that basically, so for example, for management APIs, we have the management SDK. For people that want to add authentication to their applications, we provide OIDC SDKs and for like IT admins or DevOps, we provide um, CLI tools. Um, so we have like a category for that. And then um, deciding when a feature should be included or not, um, it's based on like um, customer's request, uh, popularity of the request on GitHub, and also how that feature would simplify the developer experience of that particular tool or SDK. That's a lot to think about. I know you work a lot with .NET, right? And one of the things that uh, we encountered when I was working on .NET was .NET versus .NET Core, and now, of course, it's now back to .NET. Like, how did you handle that sort of... Uh, um, deviation, even within the same framework, right? The same, the same language even um, within the SDKs. Yeah, that's a nice question because that work was very challenging. Um, there are, um, you know, .NET has been evolving <laughs> a lot these years and we have to keep up with that. And um, it was, uh, we have the ASP.NET SDK and we provide two different versions of the same SDK, one for .NET framework and another one for .NET Core slash .NET, right? Working with .NET Core was uh, seamlessly, I would say, because there, there, there's a lot of information and how to do, how to implement certain uh, features and how to use the API. But it's not the same case for .NET Framework because it's kind of legacy. Um, and we still have a lot of people that are using .NET Framework. So we um, needed to work hard to kind of provide parity in both of, both of our SDKs. So that was very challenging because features or, or 
um, certain things that were was uh, were very easy to implement in .NET Core was a nightmare in .NET Framework. But still, we we wanted to provide like um, the same developer experience for both uh, groups of, of developers, right? .NET Framework and .NET Core. So, so that was challenging for, for .NET Framework to try to port the same features from .NET Core. I had to dig into the Microsoft, the, the ASP.NET uh, repo, dig into the code to learn how to implement specific feature that was extremely easy in .NET Core. Um, but yeah, uh, you have those kind of things and this might keep happening because we, .NET is still evolving. So the things happen all the time and you need to do the work for the customers. <laughs> yeah, so we can make it look like, oh, it's kind of the same thing to use the SDK, whereas it's a very, very different thing. And you're yeah. really putting in that work to hide those complexities. Thank you for doing that also. It makes such a difference. And you also mentioned doing a lot of work with GitHub. So is that just to publish a source so folks can look at it? Or do you invite contributions from the community to the SDKs? Yes, we love open source. Um, my team uses um, a lot of like open source projects as well. So we really love the, the open source community and definitely love uh, contributions. Um, we have uh, a lot of contributions uh, all, all the time. Um, and yes, we definitely, our SDKs, our CLIs are much better because of the community's feedback. Uh, so a contribution can be like a pull request or maybe like uh, a suggestion to do something better. Uh, we have a different type of issues on GitHub, not only uh, bugs or like feature requests, but many, many suggestions or, 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 or yeah, PRs as well. And we love that. So definitely, yeah, contributions are welcome. And we have a lot of uh, open source repos across Okta. Alisa, do you have any advice to someone who might be thinking about contributing? Yeah, I think um, it might sound a little scary to contribute to open source and especially to you know a large company like Okta, but the SDK engineers that I've worked with here are really, really nice. They're really friendly. So I'd recommend opening up uh, um, an issue or starting a conversation to say, this is something I want to do. Um, and uh, just get that, uh, uh, that conversation rolling, that feedback loop going. There might be reasons why um, they don't have that particular feature in the uh, in the SDK in the first place. Um, so it's good to know before you do all this work up front, right? And so I think just having that conversation, just be uh, the, the SDK teams are, are so sweet. It's a, it's a great time to uh, um, to learn more about what, yeah, how you might be able to contribute from them too by opening up an issue. Yeah, for sure. Because there's sometimes a lot of context. Maybe there's something that's planned that hasn't been announced yet that affects whether something's been invested in. Maybe there's some constraint that you might not have think, thought of because it doesn't affect your use case, but it's a major consideration for other users that there might, sometimes a feature might not be there because it just hasn't been prioritized yet, but other times adding the feature might um, cause some challenges elsewhere. So talking it through first is always worthwhile. We love talking to people. And Laura, has that community feedback and involvement ever given you really surprising new information, things that you wouldn't have guessed without it? We get a lot of feedback on the on GitHub uh, all the time. And I was um, surprised by uh, one specific, I just came to my mind, this, this particular feature for our ASP.NET SDK. So basically when we shipped uh, the SDK, the original SDK, we thought um, like providing an SDK for like very basic, um, the very basic scenario where a developer that don't want to deal with OIDC, just want to plug, uh, plug Okta into their uh, ASP.NET uh, applications, right? So um, it wasn't very flexible uh, because in our mind, the idea was to um you know solve everything 
internally, so developers don't have to deal with uh, OIDC mm -hmm. at all. But then we notice um, that on GitHub, many, many people started to request um, certain flexibility and to expose certain OIDC events so they could, for example, add custom claims to the tokens or, or things like that, right? So that was uh, a very popular request. And we also discovered that, hey, so this is the case not only being used by uh, very basic scenarios, but it seems that people are using it for much more advanced uh, scenarios. So that that was like a good um, discovery uh, point, I would say. And thanks to that popularity of that particular request on GitHub, we decided to make our SDKs more flexible and exposed uh, OIDC events um, so they can just extend um, you know, the logic as much as they can. That's a really interesting story too, because you might assume, oh, people want it simplified as far as it can be. But also the SDKs add some value and utility, even when you're doing the pretty complicated stuff with how they're able to elide those API changes and uh, some of that complexity, even when you're doing really advanced OIDC. Alisa, I know that you've had a chance to chat with a lot of Okta users lately about what they're building on top of our SDKs. Uh, what are some things that you see people using the SDKs for? Sure, yes, of course. And there's the, the standard authentication um, that you might expect. But then there's also things like building a, uh, a custom admin dashboard with using just a subset of the APIs and uh, features that is exposed in the Okta org dashboard, right? So there might be uh, reasons to have a smaller subset, perhaps for a specific customer or tenant or something, however you have it set up. And people are, um, you know, finding different ways to kind of really take it uh, to the next level themselves. Is that the kind of usage you expected, Laura, when you started working on the... No. <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, I was I, I was surprised when um, Alisa mentioned this particular... Um, 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 you know, uh, way of usage. Um, but but yeah, sometimes we we deliver an SDK thinking like certain use cases. And when then we discover that there are other much more complex scenarios or other uh, customer needs. And then um, we keep evolving from, from, from where uh, we started. And that's why I love GitHub because that's, our um, direct contact with real developers. Um, and also, yeah, from, from developer advocacy, we get a lot of feedback as well. But yeah, sometimes uh, developers sur surprise you with how, on how they use our SDKs and tools. It's such a constructive conversation too, rather than just asking, what would you like to build? You hand someone a tool that does what you thought they'd want and ask them, does this do all of what you want? And very often that will almost, I think, get them brainstorming about what else they could build. Like, I know I think very differently when I see a tool's list of features and I go, oh, but it wouldn't be that hard to just do this little bit further. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I also had a few questions about you as an engineer as well, because to build these SDKs in all these different languages, you're kind of just having to pick up languages when we need a new SDK in them, aren't you? How do you do that? Do you have any tips on what works well for you to just self-teach a language so you can build uh, exemplary code in it? I would say that my team, uh, it's very um, unique because we have to work with different languages, right? So first I do code reviews um, for, for projects that are written in like different languages. So that's a good point to kind of see uh, similarities or differences with .NET, which is like uh, the language uh, or the ecosystem that I work with. Uh, but then I also um, noticed that hackathons are an excellent way to um, catch up with a new language and act um, in, in a very time boxed uh, um, 
manner. Um, so yeah, I the last two years um, I participated in the Octa hackathons, and I was uh, working with Golang, mm -hmm. um, and it was like a short time, but it was enough to um, get a sense of how. Um, you know, what features you like of, of the language, what's missing based on what you are used to. Um, so hackathons are a good way. And then uh, I love to read um, technical uh, blog posts and also books. Um, I'm a book reader, so definitely books are are another way to to keep learning. SDKs are just that extra level of challenge beyond a hackathon project because a hackathon is like, let's just drop our standards until we can ship it. And it's a really good way to get your hands dirty. But then the SDK is saying this is done the right way for this language. So how do you go about taking that next step to having the confidence that you're writing the language as it's meant to be written? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically, first, I'm a developer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I I am used to certain practices, right, in my um, um, personal projects or from my previous experience. And then I'm an SDK uh, developer, right? So many, uh, many things uh, that I usually take into account, many features are because I use them all the time. Um, but then uh, when I'm not very sure about uh, the what the best way to provide a feature is, uh, sometimes I just check uh, on other um, open source repos that I respect so much what practices, what are the, the practices that they follow, and also like official guidelines for the specific uh, ecosystem that I'm working on. Um, yeah, and then... Uh, of course, when when we um, release a feature, we 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 try to think a lot about the the developer experience. But also, um, for us, it's an opportunity to um, to release that uh, and expose it on GitHub and get feedback from the community. Uh, so that that helps too. Alisa, I know that you do a lot of code examples. Do you have any other hints about picking up a new SDK as a user? Sure. Um, it's similar to Laura for first and foremost, a developer, right? So I like to get my hands on something, try it out, learn it, um, play with it. The learning is uncomfortable always, but it's always uh, uh, so gratifying to see it all come come to completion. I like looking at uh, like actual code samples from other places, including from the SDK team, because um, they do have some out there in their, uh, in the, in their GitHub repo. It's just kind of playing around with it and being able to ask questions, just like I try to put myself in the perspective of developers also trying to use Okta for the first time, right? So I look on the dev forum, um, I look at different places to try to see like, how, how would I go about doing this and try to separate it from like, how do I learn this, this particular language, which might be a whole, like a first step then on top of that is in how, then how do I use Okta? Luckily the, my internal, uh, contact. So SDK team, as well as the uh, developer support team here are really, really helpful to help uh, guide me along as well. And you really don't have to start perfect at a language to start using it. You can just go for it and it will yell at you if you tried to do something impossible. And I think that is a hurdle that some people who are getting into development might really struggle with. But oh yes, for sure. I think you're both proof that you can just do it. You can just pick up a language and go. So Laura, looking toward the future, um, are there any changes that are coming up in the world of our SDKs that you're really looking forward to? Anything that we should be keeping an eye out for releases of over the next little while? So now we uh, are not only building SDKs, we are also uh, exploring like new use cases for our customers. So we are building tools, CLIs. Uh, so yeah, um, the future we we hope to release um, new CLIs to keep um, making uh, our customers happy. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely. 
And I also hear rumor that your team is getting to work even more closely with our Terraform team. And I'll be going into some more detail on Terraform in future podcasts. But as an ops person, I'm especially excited about that seamless integration for managing your identity infrastructure as infrastructure infrastructure, as well as seamlessly fitting your identity in with your code the way the SDKs facilitate. As we wrap up, what are both your thoughts on how someone should get started with our SDKs? So we have open source repos. Um, so you can take a look at our contributing guides where we have a brief um, explanation of how to get started. Um, there are some um, also code of conduct um, that you should follow. Uh, and then just go ahead, uh, don't be shy. Uh, file an issue and yeah, or or just take a look at um, previous issues that were um, posted and how they they were fixed, how why they were closed or things like that. Uh, but yeah, um, I mean, just looking at the readme and the contributing um, guide should be enough for you to to get it started. Yeah. Say on top of that, um, on top of all of the uh, the repos that's in the Okta GitHub org uh, that houses SDK and the official samples, there is also uh, extra samples and tutorials uh, from the Deficiency team using the SDKs as well, and uh, that's in you know a couple of different places <laughs> to be honest. So I'm really excited um, that we're going to try to create a developer blog post about where we can find all these resources, try to consolidate it, because there can be a lot. There's a lot of uh, GitHub uh, orgs out there with the word Okta, so we'll try to help uh, demystify some of that as well. As a user, I've noticed that very often the samples that live with the SDK are also a test case for that SDK. So if you really want to see it being put through its paces, the samples that live close to it are where to look. Whereas if you want a very pared down, less comprehensive, but maybe an easier start, then an example showing off just one or two features that lives further away from the code might have been more demonstrating it at a single moment might be an easier start for you. So lots of different options to get involved with the SDKs and to stop having to use the API directly if you felt like you had to do that before. So we've got all these options. Um, and as always, we'll have a comments thread on this podcast on the developer forum linked from the description where you found the podcast. And we'd love to hear your thoughts about it. So thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Bye-bye.